Hello, America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to the Neo-Fusionist Book Review. This is not your typical book review, as I make no claims to political or philosophical impartiality. This podcast uses the format of a book review to explore the premise of Neo-Fusionism. Neo-Fusionism is the merging of paleoconservatism with naturalism within the framework of the revitalization of the Republican Party. We will be exploring politics, philosophy, psychology, economics, and sociology through a wide variety of books published both recently and historically. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, for this episode, we are going to be looking at Revolt Against the Modern World by Julius Evola. I'm inclined to say his name Evola. If I say it that way, please forgive me. It seems from uh, listening to some other people talking that the proper pronunciation is Evola, so I will try to follow that during the course of the podcast. Uh, now, I'm going to say a few things about the book and about the podcast before I really get into it. This was a challenging book for me. After I finished it, I was sort of tempted to go back and read the whole thing again. Um, just because it wasn't until I had really gotten into the meat of the book that I really began to understand uh, what he was saying. It came bit by bit, and then I wanted to kind of go back and look at the whole thing over again, knowing in the beginning, what I knew at the end. Um, I feel like I would understand it a little bit more, but I have so many books that I want to cover uh, during the course of this podcast that I just don't have time to go back and read books more than once, especially books like this that actually took me a while to read because uh, because it was difficult. Uh, it was difficult for me, at least. It was kind of dense, um, and there were, there were significant portions of this book that I just did not agree with. Um, there was much in the book that I did agree with, but uh, there was a lot that I didn't agree with. And so as I was reading it, I sort of had to had to keep taking everything with a grain of salt, so to speak, and kind of reinterpreting what he was talking about through my own particular lens. Um, and um, I'm going to read a few portions, as I always do. I'm going to read a few portions of this book um, for you to kind of judge on your own. I'm going to be reading portions from the beginning, uh, from the forward, and from chapter one, and um, then I'm going to read some from an early chapter where he talks about chivalry, and a lot of the center of the book I'm not going to get into in a whole lot of detail because it's almost like it's a can of worms that opening it up is just going to going to be maybe more than I'm willing to do to start getting into all of the details of what he's talking about. He's talking about a lot of historical things. This is not really the podcast uh, where I want to go into a lot of details about historical events and historical movements and peoples and and things like that, um, particularly when you're talking about things that, that are from before the birth of the United States of America. Um, I just This is a podcast about our country, about America, about the USA, and about our politics, um, and how philosophy uh, can pertain to that and pertain to what we're doing now and where we want to go from here. Let's go ahead and get right into reading some of the book. So uh, I want to read a section from the foreword, uh, and I want then I'm going to probably go straight into a section from chapter one. Um, this is not all contiguous. I'm kind of kind of cutting up the, you know, some particular sections that I like and reading them. And I'm not going to make a big deal about what I'm cutting out here, but just trust that this is not, this is not a straight run through of everything that's written. It's, it's a, it's a few paragraphs here and there that, that get to the point that I want to make. Um, so I'll go ahead and get right into the forward and then I'll let you know when I'm transitioning to chapter one, but I'm basically just going to read right through into that. And then I'll do some commentary on that, those sections that I'm reading. So without any further ado, let's get right into it. He says, quote, For some time now, it has become almost commonplace to talk about the decline of the West and the crisis of contemporary civilization, its dangers and the havoc it has caused. Also, new prophecies concerning Europe's or the world's future are being formulated, and various appeals to defend the West are made from various quarters. In all this concern, there is generally very little that goes beyond the amateurishness of intellectuals. It would be all too easy to show how often these views lack true principles, 
and how what is being rejected is often still unconsciously retained by those who wish to react, and how for the most part people do not really know what they want, since they obey irrational impulses. This is especially true on the practical plane where we find violent and chaotic expressions typical of a protest that wishes to be global, though it is inspired only by the contingent and terminal forces of the latest civilization. Therefore, even though it would be rash to see in these phenomena of protest something positive, they nevertheless have the value of a symptom. These phenomena clearly illustrate that beliefs that were once taken for granted today no longer are and that the idyllic perspectives of evolutionism have come of age. An unconscious defense mechanism, however, prevents people from going beyond a certain limit. This mechanism is similar to the instinct found in sleepwalkers who lack the perception of height as they amble about. Some pseudo-intellectual and irrational reactions seem to have no other effect than to distract modern humans and prevent them from becoming fully aware of that global and dreadful perspective according to which the modern world appears as a lifeless body falling down a slope, which nothing can possibly stop. There are diseases that incubate for a long time and become manifest only when their hidden work has almost ended. This is the case of man's fall from the ways of what he once glorified as civilization par excellence. Though modern men have come to perceive the West's bleak future only recently, there are causes that have been active for centuries that have contributed to spiritual and material degradation. These causes have not only taken away from most people the possibility of revolt and the return to normalcy and health, but most of all they have taken away the ability to understand what true normalcy and health really mean. Thus, no matter how sincere the intention animating those who today attempt to revolt and to sound the alarm may be, we should not cherish false hopes concerning the outcome. It is not easy to realize how deep we must dig before we hit the only root from which the contemporary negative forms have sprung as natural and necessary consequences. The same holds true for those forms that even the boldest spirits do not cease to presuppose and to employ in their ways of thinking, feeling, and acting. Some people react, others protest. How could it be otherwise, considering the hopeless features of contemporary society, morality, politics, and culture? And yet these are only reactions and not actions or positive movements that originate from the inner dimension and testify to the possession of a foundation, a principle, or a center. In the West, too many adaptations and reactions have taken place. Experience has shown that nothing that truly matters can be achieved in this way. What is really needed is not to toss back and forth in a bed of agony, but to awaken and get up. Things have reached such a low point nowadays that I wonder who would be capable of assessing the modern world as a whole, rather than just some of its particular aspects such as technocracy or the consumer society, and of understanding its ultimate meaning. This would be the real starting point. It is only by going back to the meanings and the visions that existed before the establishment of the causes of the present civilization that it is possible to achieve an absolute reference point, and the key for the real understanding of all modern deviations, and at the same time to find a strong defense and an unbreakable line of resistance for those who, despite everything, will still be standing. The only thing that matters today is the activity of those who can ride the wave and remain firm in their principles, unmoved by any concessions and indifferent to the fevers, the convulsions, the superstitions, and the prostitutions that characterize modern generations. The only thing that matters is the silent endurance of a few whose impassable presence as stone guests, helps to create new relationships, new distances, new values, and helps to construct a pole that, although it will certainly not prevent this world inhabited by the distracted and restless from being what it is, will still help to transmit to someone the sensation of the truth, a sensation that could become, for them, the principle of a liberating crisis. The considerations that follow will constantly revolve around the opposition between the modern and the traditional world, and between modern and traditional man. Such an opposition is ideal, that is, morphological and metaphysical, and both beyond and more than a merely historical opposition. As far as the historical aspect is concerned, it is necessary to indicate the width of the horizons confronting us. 
in an anti-traditional sense, the first forces of decadence began to be tangibly manifested between the 8th and the 6th centuries BC, as can be concluded by the sporadic and characteristic alterations in the forms of the social and spiritual life of many peoples that occurred during this time. Thus, the limit corresponds to so-called historical times, since according to many people, whatever occurred before this period no longer constitutes the object of history. History is replaced by legends and myths, and thus no hard facts can be established, only conjectures. The fact remains, however, that according to traditional teachings, the above-mentioned period merely inherited the effects of even more remote causes. During this period, what was presaged was the critical phase of an even longer cycle, known as in the East as the Dark Age, in the classical world as the Iron Age, and in the Nordic sagas as the Age of the Wolf. In any event, during historical times, and in the Western world, a second and more visible phase corresponds to the fall of the Roman Empire and to the advent of Christianity. A third phase began with the twilight of the feudal and imperial world of the European Middle Ages, reaching a decisive point with the advent of humanism and of the Reformation. From that period on, the forces that once acted in an isolated and underground fashion have emerged and led every European trend in material and spiritual life, as well as in individual and collective life in a downward trajectory, thus establishing one phase after another of what is usually referred to as the modern world. From then on, the process has become increasingly rapid, decisive, and universal, forming a dreadful current by which every residual trace of a different type of civilization is visibly destined to be swept away, thus ending a cycle and sealing the collective fate of millions. This is the case as far as the historical aspect is concerned, and yet this aspect is totally relative. If everything that is historical is included in what is modern, then to go beyond the modern world, which is the only way to reveal its meaning, is essentially a process of traveling beyond the limits that most people assign to history. It is necessary to understand that in this direction we no longer find anything that is susceptible again to becoming history. The fact that positive inquiry was not able to make history beyond a certain point is not at all a fortuitous circumstance, nor is it due to a mere uncertainty concerning sources and dates, or to the lack of vestigial traces. In order to understand the spiritual background typical of every non-modern civilization, it is necessary to retain the idea that the opposition between historical times and prehistoric or mythological times is not the relative opposition proper to two homogeneous parts of the same time frame, but rather the qualitative and substantial opposition between times or experiences of time that are not of the same kind. Traditional man did not have the same experience of time as modern man. He had a supertemporal sense of time, and in this sensation lived every form of his world. Thus, as modern researchers of history at a given point encounter an interruption of the series and an incomprehensible gap behind which, beyond which they cannot construct any certain and meaningful historical theory, they can only rely upon fragmentary, external, and often contradictory elements, unless they radically change their method and mentality. On the basis of these premises, the opposition of the traditional world to the modern world is also an ideal one. The character of temporality and of historicity is essentially inherent only to one of the two terms of this opposition, while the other term, which refers to the whole body of traditional civilizations, is characterized by the feeling of what is beyond time, namely by a contact with a metaphysical reality that bestows upon the experience of time a very different mythological form, based on rhythm and space, rather than on chronological time. Traces of this qualitative different, qualitatively different experience of time still exist as degenerated residues among some so-called primitive populations. Having lost that contact, by being caught in the illusion of a pure flowing, a pure escaping, a yearning that pushes one's goal further and further away, and being caught in a process that cannot and does not intend to be satisfied in any achievement as it is consumed in terms of history and becoming, this is indeed one of the fundamental characteristics of the modern world, 
and the limit that separates two eras, not only in a historical sense, but most of all in an ideal, metaphysical, and morphological sense. Therefore, the fact that civilization of the traditional type, civilizations of the traditional type are found in the past merely becomes accidental. The modern world and the traditional world may be regarded as two universal types and as two a priori categories of civilization. Nevertheless, that accidental circumstances allows us to state with good reason that wherever a civilization is manifested that has as its center and substance the temporal element, there we f will find a resurgence in a more or less different form of the same attitudes, values, and forces that have defined the modern era in the specific sense of the term, and that wherever a civilization is manifested that has as its center and substance the supernatural element, there we will find a resurgence in more or less different forms of the same meanings, values, and forces that have defined archaic types of civilizations. This should clarify the meaning of what I have called the dualism of civilization in relation to the terms employed, modern and traditional, and also prevent any misunderstandings concerning the traditionalism that I advocate. These things did not just happen once, but they have always been. The reason behind all my references to non-modern forms, institutions, and knowledge consists in the fact that they are more transparent symbols, closer approximations, and better examples of what is prior and superior to time and to history, and thus to both yesterday and tomorrow. It is these alone that can produce a real renewal and a new and perennial life in those who are still capable of receiving it. Only those capable of this reception may be totally fearless and able to see in the fate of the modern world nothing different or more tragic than the vain arising and consequential dissolution of a thick fog which cannot alter or affect in any way the free heaven. And that is the end of the part that I wanted to read from the foreword. Um, and I'm going to jump into part the section that I wanted to read from part one, and then I'm going to comment on the two of those sections together. Uh, so, in part one, he says, quote, in order to understand both the spirit of tradition and its antithesis, modern civilization, it is necessary to begin with the fundamental doctrine of the two natures. According to this doctrine, there is a physical order of things and a metaphysical one. There is a mortal nature and an immortal one. There is the superior realm of being and the inferior realm of becoming. Generally speaking, there is a visible and tangible dimension and prior to and beyond it, an invisible and intangible dimension that is the support, the source, and the true life of the former. These were the two natures. Tradition conceived the possibility of being born in either one, and also of the possibility of going from one birth to another, according to the saying, a man is a mortal god, and a god is an immortal man. The world of tradition knew these two great poles of existence, as well as the paths leading from one to the other. Tradition knew the existence of the physical world and the totality of the forms, whether visible or underground, whether human or subhuman and demonic, of hypercosmia, a world beyond this world. According to tradition, the former is the fall of the latter, and the latter represents the liberation of the former. The traditional world believed spirituality to be something beyond life and death. It held that mere physical existence, or living, is meaningless unless it approximates the higher world, or that which is more than life. And unless one's highest ambitions consist in participating in hypercosmia and in obtaining an active and final liberation from the bond representing, represented by the human condition. According to tradition, every authority is fraudulent. Every law is unjust and barbarous. Every institution is vain and ephemeral, unless they are ordained to the superior principle of being, and unless they are derived from above and oriented upward. The traditional world knew divine kingship. It knew the bridge between the two worlds, namely initiation. It knew the two great ways of approach to the transcendent, namely heroic action and contemplation. 
It knew the mediation, namely rights and faithfulness. It knew the social foundation, namely the traditional law and the caste system. And it knew the political earthly symbol, namely the empire. These are the foundations of the traditional hierarchy and civilization that have been completely wiped out by the victorious anthropocentric civilization of our contemporaries. All right, so uh, that was chap the section that I wanted to read from chapter one. And so now I'm going to go uh, back to that and to the section that I read from the foreword, and I want to make a few points, uh, a few comments about that. The first, the first section that I read from the foreword was talking about how uh, the origins of the ideas of tradition uh, come from kind of the time before time, so to speak, and a, and a totally different... Um, way of viewing time and a totally different way of approaching history, etc. And that as we get back to the very beginnings of recorded history, it just happens to be the like time when we get back to the beginnings of modernity. Um, and I think that this comes to a greater point that I that I wanted to make that's well, I'll try to relate this as much as possible to what I was what I was reading. Um, now, well, okay, let, you know, let me, let me, let me do this. Let me go ahead and, and, and talk a little bit about the part that I read in chapter one and then jump back to the forward. How's that? So in chapter one, he, he talks about how there are essentially two realms, two poles, two natures, one, uh, physical, natural, and one immaterial, invisible, and supernatural. Now, if you've been following my podcast at all, and you've been following the very premise of what I'm talking about when I talk about neo-fusionism, you know that I'm talking about naturalism and the refutation of supernaturalism. Um, and and so that creates a, a distinct problem with taking what he is saying uh, at face value. Um, but it doesn't mean that I would think that, okay, well, let's take this book and throw it in the trash bin. Um, because I believe that what people are talking about in truth, when they talk about the spiritual realm is that they are talking about the realm of the human mind and the subconscious mind and, um, and our evolutionarily hardwired characteristics and qualities that we repress in favor of uh, acceptance of, of modern ideological concepts. Um, I think that it, it, it comes down to the when you talk about the invisible, you're talking about your deepest thoughts and beyond your deepest thoughts, your subconscious thoughts. And our collective subconscious thoughts and our collective archetypes, those are the roots of our concepts of gods, our concepts of spiritual forces. Um, we interpret the world. We, you know, we see the sun and the moon and the differences between them and the differences between men and women, and we correlate that. And there, you know there is in the in the world there is a positive a concept of creation or positivity or adding or enhancing or or providing etc a a a a masculine notion of yang really and and yin which is a a feminine receptive uh lunar notion that which that which is acted upon you've got that which acts and that which is acted upon um, there's a dichotomy and a dualism in the world inherent to the world um, as fundamental concepts that don't necessarily have to be interpreted as some sort of spiritual invisible um, force so so much as like a like a like a, con a, a, a omnipresent concept, I guess. Um, and but it comes down to how we interpret it, um, and how we interpret the interrelation between those things. 
and in and in this book he talks an awful lot about gender and about masculinity and femininity and about a, a spiritual um, male presence, solar presence, and a spiritual feminine, motherly, lunar, earthly presence, which corresponds with the natural world, right, and the masculine corresponding with the spiritual world. Um, and this relates to the human animus and anima and the human inner masculinity and femininity that we of of which we each have an aspect in our in our own personalities um and so i think that you know it's necessary to strip away the supernatural vision of of this entire book the entire book is rooted in a supernatural vision and that has to be extracted from it and replaced with a a um sort of psychoanalytical kind of analysis of this. Um, and it, it, it does come down to like a, a right way to live, a correct way to live. Like the way that he's advocating, he's advocating as correct. Now is all of the thing, the things that he advocates for correct. Do I think that they're all correct? No. Um, do I think, I think, do I think that there's a value in modernity? Yes, I do. And I think that we, uh, we, what we need to strive toward realistically is a synthesis of these two to say what is what is good about the traditional worldview and what is good about the modern worldview um, and how do we build a synthesis between these things um, so so there's that now let me jump back to what he was talking about in the forward which was the 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 timelessness of his vision of what the traditional society looks like and 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 where those ideas were manifested in ancient prehistory and their 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 roots in mythology um and I want to bring this around around in to another another point here that I'm going to try to tie this all together here because you know, there's this kind of concept uh, when people talk about being a conservative, or or be or to say, for example, to make America great again, to is is to look backward at a point in the past and hold it up and say, this is when America was great, right? This point in time, and people people on the on the right are sometimes guilty of falling into this to say that, well, you know. The 1950s, America was great, or you know, uh, before the New Deal, America was great, or during the era of the Founding Fathers, America was great. You know, to try to hold up some point in time—that's um, a mistake, and that's you know, that's nailed by by the left. Well, you know, in the 1950s, things might have been great for you as a white male, but they weren't great for everybody. You know, or you know, the further back you go the less great they were for everybody else but you, you know, back when, well, women couldn't vote or back when black people were slaves or back when whatever, back, you know, I mean, what, you know, what are you going to go back to like the era of kings when people couldn't even vote at all, when people didn't have any rights at all, they were just, you know, the, the era of divine, the divine right of kings and you take away all of our autonomy and all of our, our freedom of speech and freedom of you know, right to bear arms and all of our, all the rights that we have, that's what you're looking back to, you know? So I think that there is an appropriate response to that, which is to say, look, you know what? The time that I'm harking back to when I look backwards at some sort of golden era is not a real time. It's not a real, it's not a real moment in time. It's an idea. It's an idea that runs through our history, and it's the idea of honoring the past, and it's the idea of honoring the wisdom of our forefathers. It is a it is a synthesis of the present era with the past. Um, it is participating in a continuous culture. It is not holding up some singular point in time. It is the past as a grand thing and even above and beyond the past for me when i think about the past that i like and that i want to bring back 
I kind of look back to like the Roman Empire a little bit. And, and even to be honest, I, what I really look back to is ancient Greece as like, that was awesome. But it wasn't really awesome because there was a lot of misinformation about how the world worked. And, you know, you're going to go back to a time before people even knew the world was round. I mean, you know, I don't want to just say, let's completely wipe out modern technology and wipe out modern society entirely and replace it with ancient Greece and we're all, we'll all wear togas. I mean, it's, it's more of a, of an idea and kind of like a utopia in a way. And I know conservatives tend to shy away from utopianism, but you know, sometimes we kind of need to have some ideal that we're striving toward. Um, I don't think it's bad to, to have some sort of vision for what we want the world to look like other than what it currently looks like. That would be essentially our version of a utopia. But, you know, the easiest response to, to this claim that, oh, you're looking back to, to idolize a past that never even really existed. I mean, that's kind of the claim, but you can turn that right around and say, listen, um, to people on the left, like you're, 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 you're looking quote unquote, you're looking forward. Um, and you're dreaming of a future utopia that not only has never existed, but isn't even related to anything that has ever existed. It's like you're giving birth to a new idea, you know, that has never been tested or tried or, or the closest thing to being tested and tried. You could probably point to like communism as like the main attempt to, to build a new, a new world under completely determined, uh, you know, uh, factors that, that deny human nature and, and kind of like decide that we're, we're clay or putty, that we're going to craft the modern man from scratch into this thing that denies our basic nature. And it turned out terribly, you know? So yeah, okay. My, my golden age that I dream about never really existed, but you know, at least it's rooted in something versus whimsy. You know, so I think that that's that that we we as conservatives should not try to pinpoint the past and we should allow ourselves like I kind of allow myself to just say, all right, you know, it's kind of like a like a gauzy, uh, idyllic daydream like vision of the past that I that I I see in a in a in a blissful reverie sometimes. Um, but I know it's not exactly a real past but it's it's something that we can work towards when we can take all of the best parts of the past and all of the best parts of the present and we can combine them and build a future out of the present and the past instead of building a future out of some 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 somebody's utopian dream um so yeah it's it's timeless. That that ideal idyllic vision of the past is timeless. And also, you know, uh, the whole the whole the whole concept of looking forward and looking backward is adopting a linear perspective of time that that is a framework. It's a mental framework that su supports and is supported by progressivism. Like you can either choose to look forward or you can choose to look backward, but why would you look backward? You know, like it's like you're walking or you're riding a bike or something or, and you're supposed to be looking where you're going. And if you're spending all the whole time with your head pointed around backwards, you're looking in the direction that you're not going. And that's the framework that is used to make you look stupid. Okay. Don't, use that framework and don't necessarily even use that concept of time. Think about time like like we were home, right? And we go home. Every day when you get out of work, you go back home again. Your time is in that way cyclical. You've got somewhere you continue to go to because it's your home. You're not homeless. If you're wandering, walking, coming, you know, neglecting where you came from and only going somewhere that you've never been before, then you're a nomad and you're ho you're homeless. If you have a home, you go back there again and again and again and again. And your perspective of time is more like I'm doing this repeatedly because this is the system of my life. And the system that I live in is my home, right? 
it's that is that is a perspective of time where it's it's not that I'm looking backwards, it's that I'm trying to get home again. You know, my home is not somewhere impossible, you know, that that it has no has has no presence in the past. I've never been to a place that I could ever refer to as home and I and I don't intend to ever get somewhere that or or maybe like I I have some vision that somewhere at some point I'm going to get to something and it's going to be home, but like the progressive vision is 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 rooted in per- perpetual progress. And, and, and perpetual progress is never, is never home. You're never like, this is where I need to be. You never stop. You never, I don't, I, you know, I no longer need to progress because I'm where I'm supposed to be. I'm home. Like there is no stopping. There is no home. This just ever onward, you know, like a, like a spaceship, you know, that's the, that's the vision. And, and so you've got to, you've got to get out of the framework of, you know, this linear, we've, we've been there, we've done that, and we're on to newer and bigger, better things. Like, let that go for a minute and think about being centered and having a home. And, and you will totally re-envision your perspective of time and of, and of where you're going, what you're striving toward, and the fact that it, yes, it has to be rooted in the past because our past is our home. Our past is our culture. All of our culture is derived from the past. We have, we are intimately bound to the past. You know, intimately. The future is empty from our perspective. The past is full and rich and the future is empty. And so we should be oriented toward the past. You know, not neglectful of the future, but primarily oriented toward the past in order to be centered and in order to, you know, in order to interact with the world and have knowledge about the world that we've gained in the past. All right, so now that I've uh, gone off on that, this is probably going to be a little bit of a longer podcast because I'm really just going off on these particular topics and I still have a fair amount to read. Uh, this part, I was I was kind of unsure as to whether or not I wanted to go into a lot of detail in this chapter. This is about chivalry. Um, and it's, it's really presenting the premise that... Um, that chivalry reinvigorates traditionalist ideas that have been neglected by Christianity. The Christianity as a whole and as a concept is not built on tradition. Judaism is to an extent built on tradition, but the New Testament is, is a breakage from everything, mo- most everything that could be considered traditional. It's it's not the accumulated wisdom of forefathers. It's one man, you know, one man who supposedly is divine, um, but it's not it's not a, a philosophy that's rooted and it doesn't embrace the values of traditionalism. And chivalry came forth in Christianity because those those drives, those human drives toward strength, nobility honor. Um, those are pagan drives, but they're also human drives. And, and paganism and hum, hum, human instinct are like closely bound together because paganism is built from the accumulated wisdom of humans. So, so chivalry allows that those traditional, that traditional wisdom to come through in a form that is ostensibly Christian, but at its core, promotes ideas like the sword and the stone and the lady in the lake if you want to you know get to the arthurian legends that are not rooted in christianity they're rooted in paganism and so i found that fascinating so i'm going to read a couple sections of this chapter and i'm not going to do any more commentary because i kind of gave you my commentary at the beginning of the section so here goes he he says quote to begin with we must be aware of the difference that existed during the European Middle Ages between the feudal and knightly aristocracy. The former was connected to a land and to a faithfulness to a given prince. Knighthood, instead, appeared as a super-territorial and supranational community in which its members, who were consecrated to military priesthood, no longer had a homeland and thus were bound by faithfulness not to people, but, on the one hand, to an ethics that had as its fundamental values honor, courage, and loyalty, and on the other hand, to a spiritual authority of a universal type, which was essentially that of the empire. Knighthood and the great knightly orders of the Christian ecumene 
were an essential part of the empire since they represented the political and military counterpart of what the clergy and the monastic orders represented in the ecclesiastical order. Knighthood did not necessarily have a hereditary character. It was possible to become a knight, as long as the person wishing to become one performed feats that could demonstrate both his heroic contempt for attachment to life, as well as the above-mentioned faithfulness, in both senses of the term. In the older versions of knighthood ordination, a knight was ordained by another knight without the intervention of priests, almost as if the, in the warrior there was a force similar to a fluid that was capable of creating new knights by direct transmission. A witness to this practice is found in the Indo-Aryan tradition of warriors ordaining other warriors. Later on, a special religious rite was developed aimed at ordaining knights. This is not all. There is a deeper aspect of European chivalry worth mentioning. The knights dedicated their heroic deeds to a woman. This devotion assumed such extreme forms in European chivalry that we should regard them as an absurd and aberrant phenomenon if taken literally. To avow unconditional faithfulness to a woman was one of the most recurrent themes in chivalrous groups. According to the theology of the castles, there was little doubt that a knight who died for his woman shared the same promise of blessed immortality achieved by a crusader who had died to liberate the temple. In this context, faithfulness to God and to a woman appear to coincide. According to some rituals, the neophyte knight's woman had to undress him and lead him to the water so that he could be purified before being ordained. On the other hand, the heroes of daring feats involving a woman, such as Tristan and Lancelot, are simultaneously knights of King Arthur committed to the quest for the Grail, and members of the same order of heavenly knights to which the Hyperborean Knight of the Swan belonged. The truth is that behind all this there were esoteric meanings that were not disclosed to the judges of the Inquisition or to ordinary folks. Thus, these meanings were often conveyed in the guise of weird customs or and of erotic tales. In a number of instances, what has been said about the knight's woman also applies to the woman celebrated by the Ghibelline Love's Lieges, which point to a uniform and precise traditional symbolism. The woman to whom a knight swears unconditional faithfulness, and to whom even a crusader consecrates himself, the woman who leads to purification, whom the knight considers his reward, and who will make him immortal if he ever dies for her, that woman, as it has been documented in the case of the worshippers of love, or love's lieges, is essentially a representation of holy wisdom, or a perceived embodiment in different degrees of the transcendent divine woman, who represents the power of a transfiguring spirituality, and of a life unaffected by death. This motif, in turn, is part of a complete traditional system. There is, in fact, a vast cycle of sagas and myths in which the woman is portrayed according to this value. European aristocratic chivalry enjoyed a formal institution through the rite of ordination as it was defined around the 12th century, following two seven-year periods in the service of a prince from ages 7 to 14 and then from 14 to 21, in which the youth was loyalty, faithfulness, and bravery. The rite of ordination took place at a date that coincided with Easter or Pentecost, thus suggesting the idea of a resurrection or of a descent of the spirit. First came a period of fasting and penance, followed by a symbolic purification through a bath, so that, according to Reddy, these knights may lead a new life and follow new habits. Secondly, at times this came first, came the walk in arms. The person to be initiated spent the night in the church and prayed standing up or on his knees. Sitting was strictly prohibited so that God may help him achieve what was lacking in his preparation. Following the example of the neophytes of the ancient mysteries, after the ritual bathing, the knight took on a white robe as a symbol of his renewed and purified nature. Sometimes he even wore a black vest reminding him of the dissolution of mortal nature and a red garment which alluded to the deeds he was supposed to undertake at the cost of shedding his blood. 
Third came the priestly consecration of the arms that were laid on the altar and that concluded the rite by inducing a special spiritual influence that was supposed to sustain new life of the warrior who was now elevated to knightly dignity and turned into a member of the universal order represented by knighthood. In the Middle Ages, we witness a blossoming of treatises in which every weapon of the knight was portrayed as a symbol of spiritual or ethical virtues, symbols that were almost intended to remind him of these virtues in a visible way and to connect any chivalrous deed with an inner action. With the decline of chivalry, the European nobility also eventually lost the spiritual element as a reference point for its highest faithfulness, and thus became part of merely political organisms, as in the case of the aristocracies of the national states that emerged after the collapse of the civilization of the Middle Ages. The principles of honor and of faithfulness continued to exist even when the noble was nothing but a king's officer. But faithfulness is blind when it does not refer, even in a mediated way, to something beyond the human dimension. Thus, the qualities that were preserved in the European nobility through heredity eventually underwent a fateful degeneration. When they were no longer renewed in their original spirit, the decline of the regal spirituality was unavoidably followed by the decline of nobility itself and by the advent of the forces found in a lower order. I have mentioned that chivalry, both in its spirit and in its ethics, is an organic part of the empire and not of the church. It is true that the knight almost always included in his vows the defense of the faith. This should be taken as the generic sign of a militant commitment to something super-individual, rather than a conscious profession of faith in a specific and theological sense. Just by scraping a little bit off the surface, it becomes evident that the strongest trunks of the sprouting of knighthood derived their sap from orders and movements that had the odor of heresy to the church, to the point of being persecuted by her. The most characteristic case is that of the Knights Templar, ascetic warriors who gave up the pleasures of the world in order to pursue a discipline not practiced in the monasteries, but on the battlefields, and who were animated by a faith consecrated more by blood and victory than by prayer. The Templars had their own secret initiation, the details of which, though they were portrayed by their accusers with blasphemous tinges, are very significant. Among other things, in a preliminary part of the ritual, the candidates, to the highest degree of Templar initiation, were supposed to reject the symbol of the cross and to acknowledge that Christ's doctrine did not lead to salvation. The Templars were also accused of engaging in secret dealings with the infidels and of celebrating wicked rites. These were just symbols, as it was declared repeatedly, though in vain, at the Templars' trial. In all probability, this was not a case of sacrilegious impiety, but of acknowledgment of the inferior character of the exoteric tradition represented by devotional Christianity, an acknowledgment that was required in order for one to be elevated to higher forms of spirituality. Generally speaking, as somebody has correctly remarked, the very name Templars bespeaks transcendence. Temple is a more august, comprehensive, and inclusive term than church. The temple dominates the church. Churches fall in ruins, but the temple stands as a symbol of the kinship of religions and of the perennial spirit informing them. The Grail was another characteristic reference point of chivalry. The saga of the Grail closely resembles the hidden ambition of the Ghibelline knights. This saga, too, has hidden motifs that cannot be ascribed to the church or to Christianity alone. Not only does the official Catholic tradition not acknowledge the Grail, but the essential elements of the saga are related to pre-Christian and even Nordic Hyperborean traditions. In this context, I can only remind the reader that in the most important versions of the legend, the grail is portrayed as a stone, stone of light and Luciferian stone, rather than as a mystical chalice. That the adventures related to the grail, almost without exception, have a more heroic and initiatory rather than a Christian and Eucharistic character. That Wolfram von Eschenbach refers to the Knights of the Grail as Templies. And finally, that the Templar insignia, a red cross on a white background, is found on the garment of some of the Grail Knights and on the sail of the ship in which Parsifal leaves never to return. 
It is worth noting that even in the most Christianized versions of the saga, one still finds extra ecclesial references. It is said that the grail as a bright chalice, the presence of which produces a magical animation, a foreboding, and an anticipation of a non-human life, followed the Last Supper and Jesus' death, was taken by angels into heaven, from where it is not supposed to return until the emergence on earth of a stock of heroes capable of safeguarding it. The leader of this stock instituted an order of perfect or heavenly knights dedicated to this purpose. The myth and the highest ideal of medieval chivalry was to reach the grail in its new earthly abode and to belong to such an order which was often identified with King Arthur's Knights of the Round Table. Considering that the Catholic Church has descended directly and without any interruptions from primitive Christianity, and considering the fact that the Christianized Grail disappeared until that time a knightly rather than priestly order was to be instituted, this obviously testifies to the emergence of a different tradition than the Catholic and Apostolic one. There is more. In almost all the texts dealing with the Grail, the symbol of the temple, still a very priestly one, is abandoned in favor of the symbol of the court or of a regal castle as the mysterious inaccessible, and well-protected place where the grail is kept. The central theme of the mystery of the grail, besides a test of mending a broken sword, consists in a regal restoration. There is the expectation of a knight who will restore the prestige of a decadent realm and who will avenge or heal a king who is either wounded, paralyzed, or in a catatonic state. Crisscrossing references connect these themes both to the imperial myth and to the very idea of a supreme, invisible, and polar center of the world. It is obvious that in this cycle, which was important to the medieval chivalrous world, a particular tradition was at work. This tradition had little to do with the dominant religion, and although it occasionally adopted some elements from Christianity, maybe it did so the better to express, or conversely, to hide itself. The Grail is truly a myth of the regal religion that confirms what has been said about the secret soul of chivalry. When looking at the outer domain relative to a general view of life and of ethics, the overall scope of the formative and correcting action that Christianity underwent because of the world of chivalry must be acknowledged. Christianity could not reconcile itself with the ethos of chivalry and espouse the idea of a holy war other than by betraying the principles of that dualistic and escapist spirituality that characterized it over and against the traditional and classical world. Christianity had to forget Augustine's words, quote, those who can think of war and endure it without experiencing great sufferings have truly lost their sense of humanity, end quote. Moreover, it was thanks to this very deviation of the church from the main themes of primitive Christianity that during the Middle Ages, Europe came to know the last image of a world that in many aspects was of a traditional type, end quote. So, yeah, I mean, you know, that's kind of a lengthy section, and so I'm not going to go into any more detail than I originally did other than to reiterate that. I think it's 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 a pretty interesting notion that that chivalry and knighthood that are so often associated with Christianity and so often used by Christians as a, as a demonstration that Christianity is not just uh, does not just revolve around um, self sacrifice and uh, and and the meek inheriting the earth and turning the other cheek and 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 getting oneself nailed to a cross um, that there actually is a, 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 a tradition of of strength and and warriors warriorhood within the Christian church, um, and they tie it to the Crusades and to the Knights of of, um, of the Middle Ages, and all that really just, it's, it's really just paganism bubbling to the surface. So I, I, I would recommend having a look at this book uh, just for the purpose of getting an idea of, of uh, some of the, some of the notions of of how we should be structuring our society and how we should be living. I'm not saying take this at face value and, and, and we should implement every component of it, but um, exploring traditionalism and exploring pagan ideas, exploring the ideas of the ancient Greeks, uh, which he goes into some, some detail about the ancient Greeks and about the Roman empire um, and, and, 
pre-Christian pagan philosophies, um, exploring that stuff and, and, and asking ourselves, how can we apply this to our lives in the modern world? You know, I think, um, you know, Christianity, you can't easily just say, listen, this is all just a big metaphor. You know, this is all just stories um, that, that, that represent something to do with the human experience. A core component of Christianity is having faith in the factuality of the story, that it is all true, the truth of it, the objective truth of Christ's resurrection, etc. Um, it's not, it, it's not welcoming to a sort of, um, a Jungian, um, archetypal analysis, the sort that, um, say Jordan Peterson has kind of been, been undertaking. Um, but paganism is much more open to that sort of thing. I think that deep down, most pagans understand and accept that they're, the gods aren't real supernatural beings. They are representations. They're symbols of archetypes. They're symbols of components of human um, society, human action, and components of the self, different aspects of your own uh, and my own subconscious lives. Um, and that they can be interpreted in that way. And I think that this book works much better for me personally, um, it, when viewed in that light. Um, and so, and so, yeah, I guess that's going to wrap it up for my review of Revolt Against the Modern World by Evola. But I am going to take, I am going to be returning to some of this, uh, stuff because as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in what, how, I'm interested in how we can apply paganism and polytheism and pre-Christian ideas and non-Christian ideas um, in in the modern world. So I am going to be returning to this, and I am going to be examining what I believe is a useful correlation between some pagan ideas and some right-wing ideas, to, to use the most basic example, the concept of reverence for tradition and reverence for the wisdom of our ancestors, something that both um, paganism and conservatism tend to embrace. And I think there's a lot of room for crossover there. And uh, and so I'm going to be looking at more of that. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, I also want to mention, I do have a Facebook page. Um, go ahead and check it out. I will post all of my shows on the Facebook page. I will also be posting various articles from other sites uh, that I think relate to my point, relate to neo-fusionism and the, and the message I'm trying to get across. And I also have a Patreon page up and I wholeheartedly encourage you to visit that and, and consider making a donation. I, I do not do this full-time. I have a full-time job that is not in this field in any way, shape or form. I work in manufacturing. Um, but I would be thrilled if I could do this full time. If I could bring you a book review every single week, I could do that if I did this full time and I didn't have to, you know, structure my book reviews and my reading time around, you know, full time job overtime. And in addition to the day to day things that one has to do in life. So my goal ultimately is to make a career out of this. And if you like the book reviews, if you think that this is something that, you know, is worth worthwhile, um, and you want to help me make my way toward that ultimate objective, uh, then consider making a donation to, uh, to the struggle, uh, to the process. So, um, I will provide a link to the Facebook page. I will provide a link to the Patreon page I guess that's all I'm going to going to say for now. Thank you so much for tuning in and uh I'll see you next time. Bye.